So here's a question we're beginning with. <clears throat> what do you imagine when you hear the word Italian? Do you think spaghetti? <clears throat> do you think ancient buildings? Do you think about the great tenors like Luciani Pavarotti and Andrea Bocelli? <clears throat> do you think of attractive people or warm and friendly people or women wearing black? Um, do you think of soccer players? Do you think of the Pope? Um, do you think of rich desserts? Well, they're all true, but there's far more to Italy than that. <clears throat> there are 53 million people that visit Italy each year. So it is, it is one of the most visited places uh, uh, that we have in, in the world. Okay, now my screen is frozen. Why isn't that moving? Here we go. Okay, so we're going to talk a little about food, culture, history, art, and fashion. Um, this is my wife, and on the right-hand side, we're in a boat in um, um, one of the most beautiful places, which is Capri, which is uh, uh, in the, near Naples. Um, but also, uh, my I took my son on a trip, 15 days, we went to 10 Italian cities. And so I then wrote a book called Italia. It's a coffee table book. I'm not selling the book, but it's a coffee table book about <clears throat> my travel with my son. We called it Italia, a father and son journey. So um, when we went, by the way, we were flying first class. I recommend that <laughs> if you can afford it. Actually, I was using travel miles, so it would have been very expensive, but uh, it is very nice to travel in first class because they, you don't, you, you're not even thinking about the fact that you're uh, in flight for, for so long. Um, in first class, by the way, the seats become beds. So um, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time sleeping, uh, sitting up in a chair. So you're a lot more rested uh, when you get there. So here we are, <clears throat> we're coming to, we're going into Italy. And let's see, I've got to admit somebody here, join us. Um, so that is uh, the, uh, the airport in Rome. And uh, all of their trains, for the most part, are high speed. Now, it's not the kind of high speed they talk about in Japan, but, but they go very, very fast. You can see how streamlined they are. So from Rome, uh, you can go up to Verona and then up to Milan uh, really quite, quite quickly. So we're going to start with Rome, which is called Roma. Uh, this was me in a play many years ago, playing a cardinal. And I was always hoping to go to Rome one day, but um, it has a 2,700 year history. So anywhere you go in Rome, you have the modern connected uh, to antiquity. Uh, there are 900 churches in Rome, 40 catacombs. These are underground cemeteries, 39 public fountains. I should add, by the way, most of these fountains have been running for about 2,000 years. The same water source, the same aqueducts, 39 public fountains, 13 castles, and five large libraries. So here's an example. This is across the street from my hotel. It was a bed and breakfast. And you have the Aurelian Wall built in 271 AD and still standing. And so, so you see these along with, you know, you see modern traffic and you, um, uh, and yet they have not, fortunately, they haven't torn down uh, any of the antiquities is all, at, at all, which is, which is great. Uh, here is another area. In the background, you see modern apartments, the serving wall built uh, seventh, uh, th 378 BC. Obviously, they did very well with construction. Uh, this is an interesting, this is from recent, I was in Italy about a year ago. And every time they build a new building, they keep finding foundations of old buildings and everything stops where, where they have to because um, they find discoveries, they find, uh, um, and these things are protected. So almost anywhere you dig in Rome, you're going to end up with uh, the foundation of an apartments, but look at the wall. I mean, that wall is probably anywhere from 1500 to 2000 years old. This is uh, interesting. This is like an old pagan temple. And you know where it is? It's right next to the bus stop where my wife and I were dropped off. And so right next to the bus, you can see there's a railing there. So, so you're not permitted to go inside, but you know, here is this beautiful pagan temple um, right next to a bustling highway and right next to a bus stop. So across the street was this church. I forgot the name of it, but there's this church and I saw a line of people. Well, every time I see a line of people, it tells me something good is happening. And sure enough, uh, this was something that you may recognize from a motion picture. This is the famous 
uh, mouth of truth. And it goes back uh, several thousand years. If you put your hand in there and, and your hand comes back out without being eaten, then you're a truthful, honest person. The, the legend is if you put your hand in, it'll eat your hand if you're not an honest person. Um, so you may remember a very famous film. Uh, it was filmed there. This is Audrey Hepburn in Roman Holiday. And if you remember the scene, Gregory Peck puts his hand in this uh, very same statue, and then he pretends that it has bitten his hand off. She goes into shock, then he pulls his hand out, and you know, she, she, I think she hits him, and then they have a good laugh about it. Um, so, so here's my wife putting her hand in La Boca della Verita, Verita's truth, uh, La Boca mouth. Uh, but where is this? This is in the airport. <laughs> this is a replica. It's not in the church. It's at the airport. Uh, this is in that church, and this is in Latin. I wish I could transcribe it for you, but I cannot. But a lot of these original tablets and inscriptions are still there. And uh, a lot of them are indoors, so they have, you know, not, not gotten uh, weathered. Uh, this is an example of you know, that's a, a holy water fount, an uh, entrance to a church. And that thing has probably been, again, sitting there from anywhere from 1500 to 1800 years. Uh, Christendom was officially started in 300 in, in Rome under Constantine. And uh, I found this interesting on the left. You know, it, it's a beautiful light. But if you look, there's an electric bulb in there. <laughs> so they've substituted what used to be, you know, a, a wax candle with probably a battery operated light. Um, this is what's called a choir stall. So uh, monks we used to go there uh, about six times a day and they would, they would chant. And the chant is taking scripture and kind of singing it. And that would be the, the chant book up there on the left. And this is underneath the church. And what is it? It's a catacombs. It's uh, empty. But you see on the far left, they put an altar there. And all these niches is where families and uh, actually uh, uh, people would have been buried. What's interesting is... Um, Often you didn't have what we would call today a coffin or a casket. You had what was called an ossuary. And an ossuary is the family would come back after a year, you know, everything is decomposed, and they would just take the bones and they would put them in a box called an ossuary. So it took less space. And so what you had in all these niches was usually a little box with an inscription with the, you know, fam family name on it. Um, the churches are just beautiful. When I brought my son, he said, Dad, why do we have to go to another church? And my answer was, because that's where the art is. And it's true. Uh, the beautiful marble, beautiful mud, And you have to look up because the, the art isn't simply uh, looking forward. Um, look at this. This is a ceiling of a church. And in the middle is a beautiful painting, probably done by a renowned artist. And all of the gilding and the work, it's just... You know, I mean, I just have to say in America, unless you're going to a museum or an estate, we just have lost that sense of decorating the whole building. And a lot of our churches today, and I'm a Baptist, so I got to tell you, our churches look like little boxes and they're kind of whitewashed and they just aren't as pretty. Um, my personal feeling, this is just my personal opinion. If you're worshiping God and, and God is, you know, exalted, then why not worship an environment that's beautiful? Because uh, because art is a gift. Now, here's something that most people wouldn't notice. I'm in a church and I see these angels, a sculpture at the top, but you may not notice what that is in the middle. Do you see that the angel is holding something? I don't know if you, what, if you recognize what that is. It's a hat, it's a red hat. Well, when a cardinal dies, if he was the cardinal, you know, the bishop of that church, it's a tradition. They take his hat and they put it way up high basically until it disintegrates. So if you go to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, look way high up, and it's usually, the, it's very dark, you'll find about six or seven hats up there. Every hat of every cardinal is still suspended. Uh, what did the tradition come from? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but that's an example. This is in the Vatican Museum. This is a, a very old uh, hat of a cardinal because red was, in fact, their color. Another color in Rome, uh, if you've been there, is... Uh, is a yellow, it's kind of an okra. It seems to, everywhere I looked, I saw this color. So it, it's also an, a color that they use in Moscow. I'm not sure what the relationship, maybe there's no relationship at all, but a lot of balconies, people love their plants. Um, I thought I'd take a picture of the directory just to kind of show you these were the buzzers outside an apartment. If you notice that all of the names either end in A, I, or O, 
Well, Northern Italy, they end in I. Southern Italy, which my family is Sicilian, and my name is Marco, O, ends in O. So if you're below Rome, they end in O. If you're above Rome, they usually end in I, a very small point, obviously. Um, but I thought, I thought, I, I like details. So continuing here. So, so here again, this is just a lady walking down a path. Oh, now uh, I'm making a comment here. All of the paths are narrow in European cities, especially in Rome. Why? Well, because they didn't have wide trucks. All you needed was a, hor a horse or a horse and cart. And they can't expand the, the, the width anymore because the buildings are very solid. But again, you see that color again, that ochre color I, I just saw all over Rome. This is a mosaic. This mosaic, again, goes back uh, probably about 2,040 years. And imagine this thing had to be pieced together one at a time. They had to understand the variations of light and dark and sometimes color. And these things, because it's, it was a, a stone in, in a, a glue or a cement, they've lasted and they're so beautiful. I mean, th this is just a walkway. And uh, look, look at the artistry there. This is part of the, what they call the Appian Way. Look at the date, 312 BC. People have been walking on that surface. Look, look at that for over 2000 years. And, it, and of course the, the stone is very thick. And so it's still, these are the very same stones that people were walking on years ago. So if you like history, um, how do we know what the Romans look like? Well, from, the, from paintings, but they didn't really start painting until closer to the Renaissance. We have very good sculptor, sculptures. Now, if you'll notice on these sculptures, just about every nose is broken, probably because the building either fell or it was underground. But we can tell what these people look like uh, by the art they left us. And uh, this is from the Vatican Museum. There's one whole hall just of statuary. And so we really do know what some of these leaders and people look like. Famous, a famous statue was found in a bay near Naples of, uh, of Caesar, Augustus. 20 BC, and, and what they know is that this used to be in color, little tiny traces of the color. Now it looks like it's white marble, but the original statue was probably in all sorts of colors, uh, probably red and blue and, and other colors as well. And they know this from, from traces. This is the Colosseum, very famous, uh, 72 AD, and it was a, a sports arena, one of the first sports arenas. You know, if we think about the sports arena where the Cowboys play, this is one of the original uh, 510 feet wide, 157 feet high. And uh, we know it used to have a canopy. It had a covering. It was kind of like an awning where there was a canvas that could be unrolled. So, um, you know, for its time, very sophisticated. It's sinking, by the way, uh, don't get alarmed. It's gonna take a couple hundred years. Why is it sinking? Because the traffic around it, now I think they're, they're closing the traffic, but it's kind of late. Uh, it's done a lot of damage. Now, this is kind of interesting. People see those pockmarks and they think it's part of uh, aging. It's not. Things were stolen from those uh, arches. What was stolen was there used to be 300 tons of iron clamps. And uh, so the Colosseum became a quarry for, you know what? The new St. Peter's Basilica. <laughs> so, so they actually because they considered the Colosseum pagan, because you know a lot of Christians were martyred there, they just stole stones and iron and melted it down. And so it became a quarry. They're not obviously doing that anymore. But as you go inside, uh, there are now lower levels where the animals were and the gladiators were. And uh, when I first went there, I was first there in 80, 1982. You couldn't go to the lower levels. Now you can. And uh, it, it's really worth seeing. They've erected a cross. And the reason for the cross is because a lot of the early Christians were martyred there and often by either wild animals. And that was considered a spectator sport. There were some very evil emperors, by the way. And the Colosseum is built on the uh, grounds of one of the emperors, Nero, who actually would cover Christians in kind of a pitch or a tar and set them on fire. He would crucify the Christians and he would use that to light his garden at night. I know that sounds terrible, but uh, that's why it, it is also considered uh, kind of a shrine by the church as well. Not far from it is the Arch of Constantine. Again, look at these. When, um, when heroes would come back, generals would come back, they would erect these arches to celebrate their campaign. Obviously, they were victorious. And then as you walk around them, you would see scenes of their campaigns. So here's kind of a wide shot of... Um, 
here's the Coliseum, and you can see the, the nearby walkways and streets. And then over on the right is the, uh, the Arch of Constantine. And as you go a little further, then you get into these uh, ancient pillars. Uh, they preserved a lot of the antiquity, which is great. Here's that film I mentioned, Roman Holiday. And uh, here's an example of a fountain. I think this is Bernini. This water has been running for uh, over 2,000 years. And of course, they're works of art. They aren't simply, a lot of cases, they're just decorative. Yes, people years ago got water from them. I wouldn't advise drinking from any of them today, <clears throat> but um, they're works of art. And uh, they're, they're just so beautiful to see. So this is, yes, the uh, Triditone Fountain, 1642 by Bernini. Uh, it's been running, like I say, for 2,000 years. Uh, this is shaped, uh, shaped uh, in a boat. It's right next to the what's called the Holy Steps or Holy Stairs. And again, 1627. Um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, kids are magnetic. Water and kids, you're, you're always going to have them going in the fountain. It doesn't matter if there's a sign that says do not play in the fountain. Uh, Fellini, Frederick Fellini, did a great film called Roma. And uh, here are two police officers. Um, motorcycle uh, officers, that's their thing. Now, this is a famous statue of Moses. It's in the, um, uh, in uh, let's see, St. Pietro in Vincoli. That means Peter in Chains. Uh, that's a famous Roman church. And, of course, their churches are very large. But you may notice something interesting. Moses has horns coming out of his head. I don't know if any of you know what that is. It's a mistranslation, and I'll explain it to you. Um, you know, the, the, the Bible was in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Hebrew, of course, was the Old Testament. And then most of the Bible was that we have is the New Testament is Greek and Latin. Well, they mistranslated the word raise means radiant, but they translated it into horns. And so Michael, it's by Michelangelo. He put horns on Moses. Of course, nobody wants to chip it away because it's a famous piece of art, but it really did. Moses did not have horns. And uh, when he came down from Mount Sinai with the uh, tablets of the Ten Commandments, they, the Bible says his face was radiant. It doesn't say that uh, he had horns. Mistranslation. Uh, churches, again, just beautiful. You don't only look at the altar and the side, beautiful art, but look at the ceilings. Um, this is a, a this is in Rome, right by the train station. Of course, I'm forgetting some of the names, but this is a, a modern sculpture of John the Baptist. You know, he was beheaded, so that probably is easy to figure out. Uh, you'll find street vendors. Uh, in this case, he was doing roasting chestnuts, and I remember this was across from the great fountain, the uh, Trevi fountain. Uh, one of my favorite dishes, uh, which I make at home all the time, healthy mozzarella, buffalo mozzarella with tomatoes and a little olive oil. Um, and um, it just, and some seasoning. So you have a lot of uh, actors around the Colosseum and other places where they'll take their picture with you, of course, for money. Uh, so they pretend to be Roman soldiers. The Trevi Fountain, by the way, 80 feet high, 68 feet wide. And it was great. Uh, what, what surprises people is not freestanding. You walk down a small alleyway and suddenly you see this tremendous fountain, but it's on the side of a building. And people don't realize that. You see that building is a palatial building and it was a palace years ago. And so the fountain is set into this building. It's not, it's not by itself. This fountain was only closed once in its entire history. I wonder if anybody knows when it was closed, purposely closed. Um, well, I'm sorry, it was closed twice. Once it was closed because somebody threw dye in it and they had to shut it down and get the dye out before it permanently ruined all the statues. But the second time was uh, in honor of a great actor and I'll go to that slide in just 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 a moment. Uh, so you have figures of horses. I mean, there's a lot of sculpture in there. Beautiful sculpture. Um, and there, is, and of course, there was a famous film called Three Coins in the Fountain. The tradition is that if you throw a coin in backwards, and these are several tourists, it's just you know, it's just a tradition. If you throw a coin into the water, and it lands in the water, you're going to come back to Rome. Well, I have thrown the coin in and I keep going back. I've been back five times. I'm not sure because I threw the coin in. A uh, couple of things that are important to know. It's at the end of the Roman aqueduct. Again, 19 B, that water is coming from the same aqueduct that was built in 19 BC. Uh, Pope Clement had a lottery to pay for the construction. It's all done from uh, travertine stone, which is the same stone as the Colosseum. Three million cubic feet of water per day is recycled through that fountain. And $1,000 a day, remember those coins that are thrown in? They vacuum them every night for charity and they give them to the poor. If you put your hand in and take them, you could be arrested. It's illegal to take a coin 
out of the Trevi Fountain for obvious reasons, because they do use it for the charity. So this is that famous scene with Marcello Mastrioni. Um, and uh, so he is in the fountain. And when he died, they shut the fountain in memory of him. And they projected his image on the side of, of the building, which was kind of a nice tribute uh, because he had done that scene. Uh, here is a, a small vehicle selling flowers from the car. What you'll notice is you go down some of these ways and suddenly you'll just find a row of motorbikes because motorbikes are the easiest way to get around in Rome. My motorcycle days are over. I actually never had motorcycle days, but you know, if, if you can ride a motorcycle, going to work and weaving in and out of Rome is the easiest way to go. I, when I first went there with my wife uh, in 92, uh, I was afraid to cross the street because they don't stop for you. And so we knew somebody in Rome, uh, a wonderful lady. Uh, she was a cardiologist and she just grabbed our hands and just, we went right in the middle of the street and everybody was screeching. I thought we were going to get hit, but she said, that's the only way you're going to get across the street. <laughs> they are not going to let you cross the street. So you have to be aggressive. So here's Dallas, you know, we are in Dallas and uh, you're familiar with uh, uh, I-20 and I-30 that go into Dallas. And what is the famous truck here in Dallas? Well, it's the Ford 150 pickup truck. Um, and of course the Navigator, that's a huge vehicle. If you've ever seen the inside of a Navigator, it's a huge vehicle. Well, uh, I'm showing you these for a reason. Uh, the Hummer, very, very big vehicle. Well, um, my son said to me, don't hurt the car. What that meant was I was leaning on a small car and he didn't want me to hurt it. It's not a toy car. That's a real vehicle. I have no idea how much it costs, but but the reason they have these tiny vehicles is because the streets are small. And really, you can get around much easier with a small vehicle because these streets, um, they have to be necessarily small. So you're not going to find uh, a Ford pickup truck. You might find a truck for deliveries, but most of the vehicles are going to be relatively small. But they do drive crazy. That's my opinion. Um, so here's my son and I eating in a wonderful cafe, um, you know, everywhere we went. The, the food was just absolutely uh, just delicious. So here, here's my recommendation. Uh, why are Italians basically very healthy? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Now, I did see a lot of people smoking, and I mentioned that to a doctor friend. He said, well, they offset the smoking by the fact that they walk all the time. There's a lot of walking, and they eat a lot of fresh vegetables. So you will have basil and oregano and, and onion, and uh, they use a lot of olive oil, which, and all of that is very healthy for you, and, uh, and, and cheese as well. So there are different kinds of uh, cheeses. Um, I, I, I can pronounce them if you want me to, but Asaggio, uh, Perconio, uh, Parmigiano, which is Parmesan, uh, Grana Padana. Uh, these are all, the, the, they depend on how long they're aged. So a soft cheese like buffalo mozzarella isn't hardly aged at all. And then when you get into Parmesan, that's probably aged about six months. And they just all have uh, different flavors. Um, one, I like Asian food, but my one complaint about an Asian restaurant is I don't get a bread basket. I know some of you are laughing, but, but it's kind of true. Italian bread. How can you be in Italy and not eat Italian bread? Uh, yes, it's carbs. If you're a diabetic like me, it's a little dangerous, but you know, I go to Italy and I cover with my insulin, so I, I do fine. Uh, but the bread is just absolutely uh, delicious. Uh, the olive oil, you know, they call it the fresh press. Virgin olive oil means it's the, the first press. And again, very healthy for you. Uh, so here's my big question of the day. Is Olive Garden, which we have one right on uh, 161, not far here from the summit, uh, and I've, I've eaten there. I went there for my birthday a couple weeks back. Is the Olive Garden a real Italian food? Well, uh, my best way to answer that question is, uh, first of all, glance into the kitchen and uh, some of the cooks may not be Italian, but it's more than that. Um, uh, a lot of the lasagna is going to be frozen, for instance. Um, here's how I would answer it. If you, find, uh, if you go to a mall and you find something that says an Italian kitchen, or uh, the Italian Express, again, at, at a mall, um, Fazioli's. Um, so <clears throat> Italian American food is not Italian. And let me go through this list real quick. It's heavier. Um, American food tends to have too much salt, too much sodium. And the portions are too large and they're often frozen. Um, garlic bread, is that Italian? No, it actually is not. When you go to Italy, you don't have garlic bread, which is butter, bread, salt, and cheese. You have bruschetta which is kind of like a toast uh, with a little olive oil on it and crushed tomatoes. 
is scrimp, shrimp scampi Italian. No, it's more American. It's got a lot of ca carbs, a lot of calories, marinara sauce. Uh, in Italy, all the sauces are much thinner and lighter. When you have a, an Italian sub, let's say at, uh, um, you know, one of the sandwich places, um, they don't eat those in Italy. Um, what you'll have in, in Italy is like a meatball sandwich, but that's very different. Uh, Italian subs have a lot of salt, processed meat, a lot of nitrates. Uh, what I'm recommending here, you can hear is eat healthy. And so Italian dressing at home, we basically just put olive oil on a salad and not, not that thick, um, you know, French dressing and um, the things. Uh, do they have fried mozzarella sticks and, and sticks in Italy? No, they, no, they don't. Um, so why, why do I say those other places aren't really Italian? Because my mother made the pasta fresh that morning, every day, whenever we ate pasta. And so we, we had a pasta machine and she would then roll out the pasta. She would take a, um, a sheet, put it on the bed, flour it, and, and then put all the, the, the pasta out on the sheet or, or she would hang it. So obviously if you're eating the pasta, it was made that day. And then you go to a place like Olive Garden, it's not gonna, gonna be the same. Um, and my mother would make uh, ravioli. The best part of the meal is the conversation. This is really very important to Italy and Europe that we eat fast in America. We eat because it's time to eat. Well, it's noon, I better have lunch. That is not the European mentality and it's certainly not the mentality in, in Italy. Uh, I can tell you that growing up, look at this quote, the meal is about family and friends. It's about conversation and laughter. You see, when, when we would have company over when I was a kid growing up, our meals would last two and three hours. It'd be multiple courses with breaks in between. I remember the older people like the man, uh, the, the men would light up a cigar and they'd sit on a couch and, and they'd have some nuts and then they would come back for another course. There were multiple courses, but you had the antipasti re really, which is the pre-meal. So uh, I made the mistake, my aunt in New York would bring out all this uh, sausage and, and uh, meatballs and spaghetti. And I thought that was the main course. Well, it wasn't the main course. That was one of the, the pre-courses because as you can see, sometimes you would have salad. And by the way, in Italy, the salad does not come first, it comes last, it's just a tradition. Um, sometimes even comes after the, the dessert. But again, these are just traditions. So I'm gonna give you some of my mother. This is a picture of my mother. She was a very beautiful woman. And her cooking advice was this to me. Uh, I, you know, I don't have all her recipes. She was a wonderful cook, but here was her basic advice. Fresh ingredients, always fresh, nothing frozen. Cook very slowly. For instance, one of the things I do well is when I make spaghetti sauce, by the way, Italians don't call it sauce. You know what we call it? We call it gravy. <laughs> it's just a tradition. And so when I cook at home, I will simmer my sauce for three to four hours. You would say, well, it doesn't take that long. Well, that's opening the ragu bottle and just putting it in a pan. I, what I'm doing is I'm simmering every half an hour some, a new ingredient like fresh garlic, herbs, sausage. You're letting all of those things cook slowly, one ingredient at a time. And then of course, eat slowly as well. So that's the basic advice. Um, fresh vegetables for sure. That's just a favorite picture of mine. <laughs> I have two cats at home. Um, so here's that color again. This is a famous hotel in the Via Venuto. I think it's a hotel. That, that ochre color, again, I'm sorry, I don't know what the tradition is, but they seem to love that color. Via Veneto was in the film La Dolce Vita, which means the sweet life. And it's like the ritzy section of, uh, of Rome. Um, and so you have, you know, right now with COVID, unfortunately, none of this is happening. And that's really sad. Um, and, and I just, you know, we all can't wait for the day that this virus, we have a vaccine so we can get back to normal travel again, because we lit literally can't. Uh, so focus on some of the water fountains. I mean, this was a small town. I was in Siena. It, it's, you know, you could put your, it was safe water. You could put your bottle to replenish your bottle of water. But look, it's a piece of sculpture. It, it's, it's a little boy with, with a, a tortoise, I believe. And the, and the water's coming out of his mouth. Um, you have faces, which are fountains. Uh, that was in a palace. Um, I like the fact that art is functional. And so you find this all, we're still in Rome, by the way. This is all over Rome, everywhere you go. Uh, this was in Perugia. This is the, the fountain in the main square. It's been there for 2000 years. Beautiful, gorgeous fountains. 
And uh, th this is a holy water fountain when you go in into a Roman Catholic church. But again, it, in America, it would just be a basin. In Rome, it is an angel holding, holding this seashell. Isn't that, isn't that gorgeous? Uh, now we go to the Vatican City, which is uh, created in 1929. See, people think the Vatican has existed for like, you know, thousands of years. No, no, no. It was created, guess by who? Mussolini in uh, 1929. It's very small. It's the size of the Magic Kingdom. So if you've been to the, the Disney, and not all of Disney World, but uh, just the Magic Kingdom, that's 110 acres. So it's the smallest country in the world. Its population is 800. Now, it has 3,000 who come in during the day uh, to work, obviously, in the Vatican. Um, but its normal population is about 800. It has its own post office, its own bank. Um, St. Peter's, this is the second St. Peter's. The first uh, St. Peter's uh, was built on the same grounds. And the tradition is that St. Peter's Basilica, which, which is actually not the Church of the Pope. I don't know if you know that or not. The Church of the Pope is down the street. It's St. Lat John Lateran Church. That because the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. Uh, he has no hi higher total uh, title than Bishop. Pope is kind of a fancy title for the administrator of the church, but he's actually, there's no higher title in than Bishop. You'd say, well, isn't Cardinal? Well, no, a Cardinal is a, an official title of, of an administrator, but there's no higher title in the Roman Catholic Church than Bishop. And so supposedly this was built on uh, the, the grave of uh, St. Peter's, St. Peter. And uh, so that's, you know, that's the tradition and the belief. But this is the second uh, St. Peter's, uh, which was built about the time of the Reformation. Uh, this, and these are all my photographs. This is looking at the dome. Uh, there's a lot of trees on the grounds and there are beautiful gardens uh, in the Vatican. Uh, this I refer to as an $800 picture. This is the famous uh, 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 by um, oh, uh, Romante. It, it's the uh, Holy Spirit. It's the light of the Holy Spirit and surrounded by the four doctors of the church, uh, Augustine and August, Augustine um, and Ambrose. And why is that an $800 picture? Because as I raised my hand to take this picture, I was pickpocketed and they stole $800 in cash, my post bar, my, uh, and it was my fault because I, I put my wallet in my back pocket and they're so good. They work at least in the Vatican. It is more pickpockets work the Vatican than any place in the world. I found out from security. One lady was bumping into me and she was the distraction. The guy who picked the pocket, I didn't feel it. He handed it off to the third person. By the time I was aware, they were all gone. There was no chance I was, I was going to get it back. So my son calls that the $800 picture. This is in the Vatican, in St. Peter's. Uh, the beautiful uh, statue, uh, it's Carrara marble of the uh, Pieta, which is the crucified Jesus after he comes down from the cross, his mother Mary is holding his body. And uh, th this is, uh, you know, I'm giving you some little facts too. This is the only uh, sculpture that Michelangelo signed. He didn't sign his other, I mean, we know he did the David, but he didn't sign his other, uh, but this one is signed. Um, and um, it was, almost, it's just behind glass now. You can't get near it and you can't touch it. When I saw it in 82, it was not, uh, no, it was already behind glass because Laszlo Toth, who was mentally ill, brought with him a sculptor's hammer, which he had hidden and broke off the fingers of the Virgin, which had been replaced, but those are not the original. They had to take some uh, stone from the back. This is uh, in the Vatican Museum, Pope Gregory, beautiful, beautiful statue. Uh, this is the famous Sistine um, Chapel paintings, which uh, uh, Michelangelo did. And of course, you're not allowed to take pictures. Uh, they mainly don't want flesh because that could age the pictures. But there's a big sign that says no photographing. And you're asking me, why did I take a photograph? Well, I'll tell you why because I was surrounded by these tourists who were all taking pictures. I won't say what country, but one country in particular, I saw like 200 cameras snapping pictures. And I thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Somebody did clap their hands and point at me, but I already had the picture. Uh, very beautiful. Um, and then you can look at the details. I mean, this is an illustration of, of hell. Uh, it, it's everywhere from paradise to hell. Um, and, and again, this is that one in the center. This is the moment of creation. That is God with his finger touching Adam. It's the creation of, uh, of, of humanity. This is one of the great stairways in the Vatican. And it's long, flat. And the reason is because you could have years ago taken a horse up there. 
So a horse can easily get up there, whereas a horse wouldn't be able to get up what we would consider normal stairs. So you've had a lot of films like Shoes of the Fisherman. Recently, they did The Two Popes, Angels and Demons. None of those were filled at the Vatican. You know why? Because the Vatican doesn't allow it. <laughs> they don't want any motion pictures. So anything you've ever seen that says it's been done at the Vatican is a falsehood. Uh, they build sets. Um, uh, beautiful statues in the courtyard. Vatican Museum has 20,000 items on display. They have 70,000 artifacts all together. It's the largest museum in the world. 54 galleries, 6 million visitors per year. Founded uh, by Pope Julius II in the 16th century. So here, here's one hall, just a, a statuary. This is called the map room. It actually is it's a hallway. But look at the size of that. That's a little boy looking up at a map. I just shot that last year. And the interesting thing is they had no GPS, no aerial photography. And would you believe that they got most of the features right? I mean, they mapped out their own country of Italy and got all the proportions of the coastline correct. How did they do that? Uh, I can't answer the question. They were very, uh, very good at it, but they didn't have what we have today. They had no aerial photography. They had no satellites, they had no GPS, and still, um, they got all the proportions right. <clears throat> Beautiful alabaster jar. Um, and here's another vase. I mean, just, you, and it takes so long. You know, if you go through the Vatican Museum in one day <clears throat> and you rush, you haven't seen hardly anything because there's so much to see. So this is in the courtyard. This is just uh, the head of the emperor Octavian. Well, you can't tell by this how big it is. So I put my son in the picture. Now you have an idea that this is not a small head at all. This is quite a big statue. Um, again, this is going to be a sarcophagus where a body had been in there. Um, and again, that could go back easily 2,000 years. And a lot of the art comes from the cemeteries because it was preserved. A lot of the ancient coins were buried with people. Uh, you're not supposed to go in them. This is me in a sarcophagus in 1982. I shouldn't have done it. It was illegal, but I got the picture, so I'm happy. Uh, so I didn't do any damage to it, quite obviously. Um, and this connects with the Vatican. There's actually a hidden tunnel that collects, uh, co connects to this mausoleum. Why? Because um, in those days, the popes were afraid of conquering armies that would con come and capture them and kidnap them. So he could escape from his residence uh, underground by a tunnel and go to the San, San Angelo um, a building. So they're all connected and they're not far, far from each other on the Tiber. Then we go into Florence. Florence was settled in 1860. Uh, uh, what dominates Florence is the beautiful, beautiful um, um, a cathedral. And so it is the largest dome in the world of freestanding brick. It, it's just, it's holding itself up by pressure. There's no, there's no steel in there. It's just red bricks. And uh, again, just gorgeous. So this is looking at it from the uh, Palazzo Vecchio, which is the famous ruling family that was there. And uh, the Medici's of course uh, were, very famous and they controlled Florence for many, many years. And you can, you can visit their, their palace, the Medici Palazzo Vecchio. Um, this is a, um, some beautiful uh, bridges going over the, uh, the waters. None of them are original. Now they were created by the same stone. You know why none of the bridges, save one, are original? Because the Nazis destroyed all of them. Uh, remember most Mussolini, um, made a compact with Hitler. And when the allies came in, which would have been the Americans and the British and the French and Canadians, they came up from the South through Sicily. And of course, what the Nazis wanted to do was uh, stop them. And so what they did was they blew up all these bridges that were, uh, you know, uh, anywhere from 1600 to 2000 years old. They did go in the water and get the original stone, but um, uh, Florence is famous for art. There's just art everywhere. Uh, this is the famous cathedral, 500 feet high um, is the bell tower. And here is the main cathedral. These are the famous doors, the gates of paradise by uh, Gilberti, 1059. There, you see this on the outside, but uh, a lot of people don't realize the outside ones is a reproduction because it's real gold, it's, it's gilded. The real ones are there, but they're inside. So you've got to go inside the baptistry to see the real ones, but they are just a gorgeous uh, piece of work. Uh, a film was made there called Room for a View. This is a famous uh, David, weighs 12,000 pounds, it's 17 feet high. Uh, it is just absolutely worth seeing. Uh, it used to be outside for years. It was outside, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, I think for about uh, 300 years. So it had a little bit of uh, environmental damage, but they finally decided to bring it in. All done from one piece of marble that, by the way, was flawed. If you look at the back of the leg, I don't have a picture of it because you're not allowed to take pictures, except the one I took. Um, there is a scar in the back and other artists rejected that piece of stone because they said it was flawed. And Michelangelo saw a possibility in it. And we have one of the great works of art. You know, they have souvenirs of it everywhere. This is a reproduction that's in the courtyard where the original used to stand. So this one is not the original one. This one's more or less a plaster. And uh, you have these people who, now th this just gorgeous uh, um, cathedral that you have in, in, in Florence. Um, you have these markets like, and for different things, like you have one market just for leather. So you have purses, um, these locks, there's a tradition on the locks. When you get engaged, you put a lock on the entrance to a bridge. They have this in Paris too. Then you throw the key in the water. So the, the symbol is that our relationship is going to last forever and you can't find the key and the lock symbol. The problem is the city fathers don't like this because every year there's thousands of locks and the weight of the locks are not good for the bridge. So they have to cut them off. This is the only bridge that is still there, the Ponte Vecchio, the old bridge. And you know what it is today? It's jewelry stores. And uh, it connected from the palace I mentioned to their, to their art gallery. Why didn't this one get destroyed? Well, there's a reason. A Nazi general disobeyed Hitler. Hitler said, I want every bridge destroyed. And the general just said, it's too beautiful to destroy it. And he disobeyed him. And so we have that original bridge in Florence uh, because we're grateful to that general for having done that. So uh, if you love jewelry and um, Italian jewelry is very beautiful, they use a lot of gold and a lot of uh, intricate work. Um, and it's reasonable, the price is reasonable. They don't, they don't barter, you know, um, people think you can haggle. Uh, you can do that in uh, Central America and Mexico and a lot of places where you can, don't do it in Italy. <laughs> they don't appreciate it. Uh, if that's the price, that's the price. Now they'll show you something in your, you, you tell them what your price market is and they'll show you something. But, but you'll insult them if they say it's, you know, costs this much and you start trying to lower them. They don't quite appreciate that. Um, uh, but you're going to spend a little bit of money because it's just a beautiful, intricate uh, work. Uh, very, they have great artisans. This is the uh, Palazzo Vecchio. That's the Medici Palace. Um, and it, it, it's been the site of many things. They've had hangings there. They've had uh, burnings at the stake. Um, a famous philosopher, Bruno, was uh, 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 burned at the stake there. So it had, it has a lot of tradition and history. But from, from the palace, looking up, you can see their, their famous tower. Um, this was Holy Week when my son and I were there. So uh, that's why there's the, the draping <clears throat> of the crucifix. And so, uh, again, uh, we, we happened to get there on the night of, um, um, it wasn't actually Good Friday, it was Saturday night. And there was a bonfire and we didn't quite know what was going on. Well, very simply, it's in one of my books. At, at sunrise, this is Easter sunrise, every bell in the city of Florence starts ringing. And then fireworks start going off and then cannons start exploding. It, it is something, we were so grateful to be there on Easter morning because, um, and then there's a parade and the parade comes down the street and they're all dressed in Renaissance costume. And there's brass and uh, trumpets um, they make a very big deal out of Easter, which is great. You know, Americans tend to emphasize Christmas, but if you're a Christian, what you realize is the most important date is Easter. Because <laughs> if there wasn't a resurrection, I know I'm getting theological here, but the resurrection, uh, without the resurrection, Easter, uh, Christmas is kind of meaningless because it's going somewhere. And so they, they in Florence in particular, then a symphony orchestra uh, played in the courtyard. And I was able to get these beautiful pictures of the orchestra playing. Um, and, and of course, everything echoed beautifully in the courtyard. So it was really amazing. You, there's music everywhere. Street musicians are playing everywhere in, in just about every city I went to in Italy. And, um, uh, and they're very good, uh, quite good artisans. They always collect crowds. Um, these are gypsies. Now, whether they were real gypsies or pretending to be, I have no idea, but they were dressed as gypsies and, and they were playing in front of a church. Uh, here's a bakery. Uh, the cafe is, again, they don't rush you. So you can have a leisurely meal and you can be there two hours, three hours, because part of it members having conversation. So when we first land, this is what my son says to me, dad, I'm on a diet. Okay, 
we've just landed in Italy, mm -hmm. right? And he said he's on a diet. Well, he saw some cannoli and of course he tried the cannoli, he sampled that. And then he saw gelato and he hit every gelato shop there was. It's like a rich, creamy, it's better than ice cream. And I say, Luke never met a gelato he did not like. And so from that point on, the diet was off. Um, they come in these ex great flavor. What they do is they put fresh fruit in there, but they also do that to show what the flavor is. And it, it is really um, something to have. So look, if you go to Europe, don't put yourself on a diet. Um, you've got these wonderful pastries. Uh, like, like I said, I, I'm a diabetic. So, you know, I had to be careful. I took a lot of extra insulin, but, but to deprive yourself of one of the greatest things in a foreign country, which is the food. Uh, this was uh, like a, a market uh, that was set up. <laughs> yeah, it's a pig's head. And they would actually cut the meat right off the pig for you to make a sandwich. Um, but again, these out, outdoor cafes, um, just very, very, very pleasant. Um, again, the pizza in Italy is nothing like the pizza here, and especially not the frozen pizza. Our pizzas tend to be very thick, uh, too much cheese. Theirs tend to be uh, uh, very light and crusty. Um, and, you know, they'll put, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, other ingredients, a lot of seasoning, as you can see. Um, this is just my scene of door. The, you know, some of these doorways go back to the Renaissance. And, um, and I realized, by the way, if you're listening, that I'm not going to finish Italy today because I got like another 12 cities to go. So I'm going to wrap it up about 10 minutes after three, and then we'll find another day and I'll record where I've stopped, what city I've stopped at. But, you know, you just simply don't have buildings. Look, at you have these elaborate uh, entryways. This was a, a little hotel. But again, it's a work of art. And so everywhere you look, the entrance to a building, whether it's an office or a hotel or in some, an apartment complex, uh, is an arch that, again, goes back probably to the Renaissance, which would be 15 to 16. Now, look, at this is all carved wood. My son's pointing to that. Now, now, there is a reason why they're tall. And you may have guessed what it was, but sometimes you would go into your house with your horse, <laughs> and especially if it was a public building. And so look at this, I'm outside of a church, but a, a tall doorway also speaks of importance. So obviously they were shorter than we were. They weren't six feet, they, some of them were five feet five, five feet six, but the doorway says this is an important entryway. And so, so look at me compared to the doorway. I mean, it's just magnificent. Um, and, and, and again, uh, it's a combination of, you've got these iron studs with natural wood, uh, again, here's this beautiful archway. Look at this doorway. This is the Milan Cathedral. And actually, because many people in these days were illiterate, they'd have Bible scenes. So they would teach people about the Bible visually. And a lot of them couldn't read. And so as you walk around the cathedral, it could take 20 minutes, a half an hour. The, the door and all the reliefs were a teaching mechanism. Uh, then we go to Siena. That'll probably be the last country I can go to today. It's a hill town. Many of the countries are built on hills, really not, you would say, because they wanted to be picturesque. No, the reason they built them on hills was uh, for invading armies. You're safer on a hill because you see who's coming. That's the obvious reason. Um, and so this was settled in 900. Uh, this is the scene. Siena is, they put dirt in the courtyard for the Piazza del Campo, they have the horse race once a year. We weren't there when it was, but you can see it's a hilltop. You can look way down, 70 AD, that's how old it is, beautiful city. They still hang their clothes outside. I don't know if they have modern dryers, but everywhere you look, people are hanging their clothes. And uh, of course, I remember my mother doing that when I was growing up. The older people, what is their favorite activity? Talking and watching. If you're an American, they watch you. They look at you. And by the way, they know you're American. They, uh, you're close. They can look at your shoes and they know you're an American. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the palace in Siena. Again, this uh, beautiful tower. Uh, and again, everywhere you look, there's beautiful sculpture. Uh, so this inner courtyard, it's kind of like the town square. Remember, before movies and TV, what did people do? Well, they came together. We've lost that tradition, haven't we? Uh, what, what is our town square today? The mall? Oh, I wouldn't think so. I mean, you know, turn of the century America was the town square. Look in Texas. Every little town square has what? A, court, uh, a courthouse. And they pretty much all look the same. 
And that was the gathering for people. Well, in Italy, when you go back thousands of years, um, so here they, here they have filled out, this is not my picture because I wasn't there for the race. These families uh, come together. And by the way, it's very dangerous, not so much for the crowds. There's a lot of, but people have died in these things. They race around this track and it's, uh, the angles are very steep. Um, and each family has their own color. So this tradition goes back uh, again, back, back, to, back to the Renaissance. But you can see there's a stumble right there. Um, and, but people come from all over the world to see these races. I don't know if they bet. I don't know if it's legal to bet. Uh, soccer is the big sport. Um, but look at the gestures, okay? Um, this means uh, when you put your hands together, it means, well, what are you trying to say to me? What are you telling me? Uh, Italians speak with their hands. Those, that's a common gesture. When I first went to college, I was talking to a classmate, and a professor came from behind me and grabbed my hands and said, now talk. And so I've learned over the years that I use hand gestures because I learned it from my family. He's a little child with a hand gesture. And uh, I watched this guy, I was sitting in a park in Milan and these two guys were talking and their hands never stopped. They never stopped for more than 30 seconds. So again, it's, uh, there's a famous phrase, if your hands aren't moving, I can't hear you. <laughs> so it's just kind of, kind of funny. Uh, this, is the, this is one of the courtyards in Siena. And uh, again, it's a hilltop town, so it's just beautiful. You're gonna, a lot of the rooftops, of course, are going to be made out of this um, um, beautiful um, um, stucco. Stucco. It's it's like a uh, a ceramic that's baked, and uh, you can you can replace just pieces of it. And again, remember I said all the walkways are very narrow. Well, the buildings can't move anymore, and so you could maybe get two people down this walkway. A motorcycle, yes. A car, probably not. Uh, this is interesting. This was a little cafe. Uh, here's my recommendation. When you're looking for a place to eat, don't eat where the tourists eat because that's off the beaten track. That's where the tour bus is going to stop. Walk in about a mile or two. My son and I did that. We walked about a mile and a half in. We found this little cafe. Now, let me tell you. You see how many tables are there? One, two, three, four, five. I think there were five tables in the whole cafe. Well, guess what? The cook was off duty, came in for us, who lived around the corner, and cooked just for us. So we said what we wanted. It was a menu. And then it was cooked. It wasn't, you know, you go to a restaurant today in America, and they cook large vats of things. And so usually you get your food pretty quickly because it's pre-cooked. This was, we waited a long time because it was cooked just for us. And they actually, they didn't open the restaurant for us, but we did. My son and I went to a little restaurant in Pompeii that the hotel restaurant only opened for us. So if we said we weren't coming back, they didn't open. And if we were coming back that day, they only opened for us. So um, that's just really great. And I took pictures of all my food. So again, if you look, you have a prosciutto, which is a very thin ham. Um, the uh, the uh, pastries are out of this world. Um, the, the street vendors are really great. This is a, a street vendor doing, um, I think it was, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, Red Riding Hood and the wolf. And you see this little, little boy looking up, very interested. This was a man who he pretended he was an old time photographer and he was painting himself gold. Well, you see the guy on the left? He ended up painting his face gold. I hope that paint was safe. I really do because that's what he looked like when he finished. His hands and his face were covered in gold paint. And I'm, personally, I don't know if that's really safe. I mean, it was really interesting to look at. Um, and you had these street artists. They were great artists. And you know, they were, they, were doing it, they were doing reproductions of famous paintings in chalk. So it's not permanent. Uh, you know, they depended on people putting coins in a box and the next rain came along and it all, all went away. But they took great pride in doing that. And uh, this is gonna be my last one because I got five minutes. Milan was pretty much, Milan is a very, uh, Milano is the Italian, was mostly destroyed in World War II by the Germans. It's the second largest city in Italy. It's a northern city. It's a, you can see Switzerland from if you're at a high elevation. It's known for fashion, design, and commerce. One of the things we noticed is the women and the men in Milan were dressed beautifully. Now, not that they weren't dressed nice in Rome, but they had the latest fashion, beautiful suits, um, um, and, and it goes back many, many years. The greatest thing is the Milan Cathedral. If you go to Milan, you've got to go to the cathedral. It's the largest church in Italy. It's larger than St. Peter's. It's the fourth largest church in the world. 
uh, took six centuries to build. Now, I think most of you understand that, that cathedrals were built by families and from generation to generation. So six centuries could have easily been 12 families or more of artisans and sculptors. Um, its dome is 260 feet wide. It's 520 feet long and 300 feet wide. And it has 135, 365 feet spires, which have statues on top, by the way. Uh, here's an example of those doors again that have those reliefs. Uh, now you can go up there, you can walk up there. My son and I went up there and my wife went up there. At the top of every spire is a statue. Um, imagine the amount of weight. This thing had to be built great because this is all stone and it's the roof. They do have what's called flying buttresses. And if you know anything about architecture, that keeps the pressure on uh, the walls um, to, keep it, to keep it up, quite obviously. Uh, when Notre Dame partially burned down about, what was that, about a year ago, what they were concerned was that if the flying buttresses uh, got destroyed, the whole building would collapse. As far as I know, Notre Dame has survived. But that was their great fear because even stone uh, under heat can collapse. But here's an example of just one statue on, on these spires. Um, that's my son going to the edge. I didn't quite like going to the edge because <laughs> it was straight down. He didn't have a fear of height that I do. Uh, this is the Milan Cathedral. Look at, look at, that is the floor. It is all beautiful mosaic. It's all marble. And I dare to say there are some churches in America where you'll find marble, but this is rare. I mean, I mean this is artistry in every inch of it. Um, my son, this is a side altar. If you know anything about Catholicism, in a cathedral, sometimes you have the main altar, but then you have these side altars because priests would do masses at different times of day. And my son said, what is that on the altar? That looks like a casket. And I said, well, it is. And he said, well, why would a casket be sitting on top of an altar? Well, they put a mask over him because he doesn't look too good now. From all accounts, his skeleton has turned black, uh, but that is uh, Charles Borromeo. And he was made a cardinal at the age of, I think he was 12 or 13. Uh, I guess we could guess that the family paid for it. <laughs> we won't get into politics of that, but he was the head of the Counter-Reformation. So after the Reformation, uh, he did the Counter-Reformation, so he's kind of important in theology. So here's just a, a, an intersection. Look at the modes of uh, transportation. So you've got the electric tram, you've got the motorcycle, you've got somebody walking, you've got a small car, you've got a bicycle, and you've got a scooter. So you see all of these things coexist next to each other. You have these bikes in a row for rent that you find in a lot of European cities. And then again, you have these beautiful outdoor cafes. I always prefer to eat outside. Look at this out. If you like shrimp, fresh shrimp, I know I'm making myself hungry. I didn't have lunch yet today. Um, uh, here you've got some, uh, let's see, corn and black olives. And, and again, um, all of the, it wasn't, it wasn't the uh, lettuce we use. Uh, it's the, uh, what's the term I'm trying to use? Um, you, you know, kind of that, that garden. My, my mother used to make my father stop the car and she would pick dandelion leaves. Now you would say, Dan isn't that that yellow flower? Uh-huh. She would take the leaves and actually she would um, she'd wash them and then cook them and make them into a salad. So we're, we're just about done for today. We're gonna finish on Milan. Here's another example of a salad, again, uh, very healthy. Uh, the pastas, again, uh, very, very delicious. And this is the first mall in the world. What they did was they enclosed these shops and they put a roof over it. This is Milan. And this, it's called the Galleria. That is the first mall in the world. And it's lit at night. It has high fashion. You can't expect, unless you're very wealthy, you can't afford anything there. It's all the high dollar shops uh, that you can possibly imagine. But the dome is glass. It lights up at night. And uh, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, so I will remember that when we come back to Italy, the place where I'm supposed to be is uh, the angels. I got a lot more cities, but I know for sake of time, I must finish on time. And so I wanna thank you so much um, for being with us 